In this video, I will be performing La Fligée by Armand Louis Couperin, published in his Pièce de Clavecin in 1751. Our current view of music history is not particularly kind to the period between the Baroque and the Classical eras. Indeed, its common designation as pre-classical reflects the negative value judgment associated with the composers of that time, who are usually regarded as transitional figures that, on the one hand, moved away from the style of great Baroque composers, such as Johann Sebastian Bach and Handel, and, on the other hand, had not yet reached the level of maturity found in the works of Haydn and Mozart. Hence, they are pre-classical in the sense that they haven't really gotten to the classical style yet. Indeed, in his book, The Classical Style, Charles Rosen claims that these pre-classical composers were unable to explore the full potential of their musical material, and it was only Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven that were actually able to do so. Incidentally, it is revealing that when the name Bach is mentioned on its own, it's generally assumed we are talking about Johann Sebastian and not any of his sons. This, in my opinion, is a simplistic view for at least two reasons. First, it ends up lumping together several distinct styles that coexisted at the same time but are aesthetically different from each other. For instance, the Galant style tends to be lighthearted, places an emphasis on homophonic textures, and usually follows recognizable forms. By contrast, the Empfindsamerstil, usually referred to in English as the sensitive style, emphasizes expression over form and can contain all sorts of surprising twists as it does not usually adhere to one particular mood. Additionally, it can also combine different genres and formal patterns. The second reason I find this generally dismissive view problematic is that it overlooks the unique musical contributions of many of those so-called transitional composers as well as the significant influence they exerted to later generations. The indebtedness of 19th century romanticism to the Empfindsamerstil, for instance, has been generally overlooked. Armand Louis Couperin lived between 1727 and 1789 and belongs to the generation of composers and harpsichordists that include among others, Jacques Dufly and Claude Bénigne Balbastre. One of the designations associated with music in France in the years between approximately 1720 and 1770 is the term Rococo, which signifies a style that, like the Baroque, is highly ornamental, but unlike the Baroque, is meant to be purely decorative, whimsical and light. In other words, it does not have any of the seriousness and solemnity associated with Baroque music. The term Rococo is also used in relation to the music of earlier French composers, like Rameau and François Couperin, whose music may contain light-hearted elements, but also maintains the seriousness and complexity of the Baroque style. I should add, though, that even when seemingly light-hearted, François Couperin's music is almost always tinged with melancholy under the surface, and Rameau admittedly lightened up and simplified his musical language as he grew older. These two composers, however, are still held in high regard, which is not always the case with the composers of the next generations. In other words, those born after 1700. Here, there is a very different paradigm at play, with the music of these later composers 
usually associated with a purely light-hearted and decorative style, a style whose musical expression is mainly superficial. However, while one can find such music in the output of these composers, since it also reflects the expectations and demands of the musical public at that time, this association overlooks the rich expressive content that is also present in much of this repertory. Armand Louis Couperin's La Fligée is a case in point. We can divide Armand Louis Couperin's Pièce de Clavecin of 1751 into two suites. The first one is in G and the second in B flat. I didn't mention the terms major and minor because while both suites are predominantly in the major mode, some of the movements are in the parallel minor mode. This is especially true of the suite in G, since G minor was a fairly common key at that time. However, the situation is very different for the suite in B flat, because B flat minor would have been considered a fairly unusual tonality at the time, and also one that would possibly sound quite spicy in many of the contemporary French temperaments, which we could describe as different varieties of modified mean tone. You could say that the suite in B flat contains three pieces in B flat minor, the second of a pair of gavottes, the second of a pair of minuets, and La Fligée. But since the second gavotte and the second minuet are followed by the repetition of the first gavotte and the first minuet respectively, they're still framed by B flat major. Not to mention, both are also fairly brief pieces. This leaves La Fligée as the only extended piece in the entire collection that is truly in B flat minor. If I were to characterize the expressive content of La Fligée, I would say it presents a most eloquent, poignant contradiction of the common view of this repertory as superficial, because there is absolutely nothing superficial about it. I've already mentioned that elements of 19th century Romanticism are present in the Empfinzimer Stil. La Fligée may not really belong to the Empfinzimer Stil, but it shares its emphasis on expression. In this way, La Fligée is not far removed from 19th century Romanticism. I would like to offer a few suggestions for performance and then demonstrate by playing the opening measures of the piece. However, the best demonstration is hopefully, the performance itself. So please keep these suggestions in mind as you listen later to the performance and follow along with the score. The first suggestion concerns rhythmic flexibility and the choice of tempo. These may seem as two separate issues. However, I think choosing a particular tempo usually affects how we approach rhythmic flexibility. My choice of tempo for this piece definitely falls on the slow side of the spectrum because I feel it reflects the expressive quality of the piece. At the same time, I also feel this piece should have a certain flowing quality, a certain lilt, if you will. The trick, therefore, is balancing these two elements by settling on a tempo that is not too slow in order to maintain this kind of flowing quality. As I've mentioned in previous videos, one important distinction in relation to modern traditional musical training is that you have to think of rhythmic flexibility not in terms of a long melodic line, but rather in terms of how you shape the music's individual short phrases or gestures. In this particular case, because of the slower tempo, it is necessary to be careful with the amount of rhythmic flexibility, since using too much 
may result in losing a sense of pulse and undermining the flowing, lilting rhythmic identity I mentioned earlier. In terms of not sine gun, taking into consideration the character of the piece, I use them in a flexible manner. This means that I vary the inequality, especially as I wanted to highlight rather than obscure the identity of individual gestures. And in general, it's an effect I try to use in a subtle way rather than make it very obvious. When it comes to ornamenting and embellishing the repeat of each section, again, I keep in mind what the character of the piece is. This means that any type of embellishing should enhance the expressive content. So in this context, I avoid doing anything extravagant. Like with Not Senegal, embellishments are subtle. One final suggestion concerns the numerous grace notes you find in the piece. Now, I'm not referring specifically to performances of this piece, but in general, I have listened to many performances where grace notes tend to be performed too literally and too equally, as if they had a specific rhythmic value. I think we need to keep in mind that grace notes are nothing more than another form of ornament, and this means they don't have a specific value at all, and as far as I'm concerned, should also not all be performed the same way. What I would suggest doing is, in addition to treating them as ornaments, in other words, not as important melodic notes, you should also think of them in how they shape the expressive content of particular moments. And then you play them a little faster, a little more slowly. In other words, in any which way you feel that it enhances the expressive content of that particular moment. And obviously this also means that your reaction or your interpretation to these grace notes is going to vary from performance to performance. Now, what I wanted to demonstrate for a moment is what I do when it comes to how to separate phrases from one another. So we're talking here of slightly longer units and it has to do with how we take time, how we use tempo in a flexible way. Now, what I would like to suggest here is that what I do has to do with not doing some sort of an extended retardando. In other words, we're getting towards a cadence, we're getting towards the end of the phrase. And again, the more modern traditional approach says, okay, well, we can start doing a little retardando as we're getting towards the end of the phrase. I would like to suggest a slightly different approach here, and that is that you basically keep a fairly consistent tempo, and when you get to the final chord, right before you get to that final chord, you hesitate a little bit in playing it. And then, before you move on, kind of linger a little bit on that chord, take a breath, a mental breath perhaps, and then go on with the next phrase. Let me show you what I mean. Now, obviously, as I mentioned before, I'm not going to play in a metronomic way. Uh, the whole piece is going to be performed in a flexible tempo that also respects that flowing quality I talked about. However, Notice what I'm going to do when I get to the end. I'm not going to make a big deal out of it by doing some sort of retardando. It all has to do with how I approach the final chord of a particular phrase and how I leave it, how I go on.
hope you noticed what I did there when I got to this when I got to that chord. What happened was that I slightly hesitated before and then a little breath in and I will do the next one in a moment. I exaggerated the effect a little bit. I think when you actually listen to the performance, you will be able to hear it done in a little better way, at least as far as I'm concerned. But I hope that I have alerted you to the kind of approach that I'm using. So this is what I'm going to do for many of these ends of phrases, these, these cadences in the piece. And obviously I'm not going to do every one of them exactly the same way. Um, but it's very important, again, to kind of take uh, a little breath as you go on and hesitate a little bit also before you get to the final chord. Um, let me play the next phrase that comes up and again you will see what I mean. So continuing now from the where I left off. <laughs> Etc. Etc. So it's this this kind again a little hesitation before the chord, a slight breath before going on. As always, thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoy the performance.